Oh, Lord God Almighty. Oh, Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to sing, sing, sing for you. Gonna sing, sing, sing for you. Lord God Almighty. Oh, Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to sing, sing, sing for you. We're going to sing, sing, sing for you. I say we're going to work and pray and sing every day for you. We're going to work and pray and sing every day for you. Oh, Lord God Almighty. Oh, Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Oh, Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Going to live, live, live for you. Lord God Almighty. Oh, Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're going to live, live, live for you. Going to live, live, live for you. I say we're going to work uh -huh, and pray and live every day for you. Going to work uh -huh, and pray oh, yeah. and live every day for you. Yeah, Lord God Almighty. Oh, Lord God Almighty. We're gonna die, die, die for you. Gonna die, die, die for you. Sing it, Lord God Almighty. Oh, Lord God Almighty. Yeah, we're gonna die, die, die for you. Gonna die, die, die for you. I say we're gonna work and pray and die every day for you. We're gonna work uh -huh. and pray. Oh, yeah. And die every day for you. Sing it, Lord God Almighty. Oh, Lord God Almighty. Sing, Lord God Almighty. Lord God Almighty, sing Lord God Almighty, Lord God Almighty, sing Lord God Almighty, Lord God Almighty. Good morning. Good morning, friends and family. Good morning, Valley Christian. Uh, muy buenos días a todos. Me llamo Samuel para los que no me conocen. My name is Sam Anderson. For those of you that do not know me, and I have the privilege of just being able to share God's word with you all this morning. Um, I help serve on a part of the staff here at Valley Christian, and along with my wife, who also serves on staff, we have the privilege of leading the youth and family ministry. We're super excited about that role. We're super excited about that focus. We're just passionate about families. We're passionate about our family. We're passionate about other families, just learning how to seek God together as a singular unit. We're passionate about parents, just learning how to live out the gospel at home, really just portraying God's love and mercy and grace, but also his discipline and his standard in the home as well. Uh, we're super excited to be working with the families here in the Las Vegas area. And speaking of Las Vegas and just the youth and family here, we have a youth and family event coming up. Uh, hopefully you received that email if you're a part of youth and family uh, last Wednesday. So if you didn't, please check your spam folder, uh, maybe go back to that date. Um, but if you didn't receive an email from us, uh, it's possible that we just don't have your email. So please reach out to us. We would love to have a youth and family meet and greet where there'll be food, there'll be fellowship, there'll be games, there'll be a chance to just even talk about the future and just the different dreams and visions we have for the youth and family. It's going to be a great time. So please uh, tune in, uh, stay tuned for more details coming on that event. Amen. But for this morning, um, like I said, I have the privilege of being able to share God's word with you all. The title of this morning's message is Cornerstone. And we get that from a number of, pas a number of passages. We're going to start in Ephesians 2. But before that, let's go to God in a word of prayer. Uh, dear Father God, thank you for this chance just to be able to talk about your word. Talk about your son. Please guide us in our understanding. Just guide us in your truth, Father. Teach us, open our hearts so that we can see the beautiful things in your word. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So starting off in Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to read verses 19 to 21. It says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. Now, in this passage, what Paul is doing, he's, 
he's basically bringing this imagery of a building to describe uh, the identity of the church, who, who the believers of God are to be like. It's like a building. And then he goes in to say, goes on to say, well, there's a foundation established by the apostles and prophets, but then there's a chief cornerstone in that building, and that is Jesus Christ. And you have to think, okay, well, what is a cornerstone? Well, at that time, uh, a cornerstone was very strategic when it comes to architecture in terms, in terms of building structures at that day and age. And basically, the, the cornerstone would be this large, uh, stable, firm stone that was primarily placed first in building a structure. And what it would do, uh, the purpose it would serve is set the, the foundation. It would set the direction and the standard for the foundation. It, it was essentially the measure, the measurement guide. It was, the, it was the, the standard when it comes to alignment for every other stone that was placed after that cornerstone. As you think about the cornerstones in that day and age, you could begin to make the connections with Jesus Christ and his role in the church. Jesus Christ brings the standard. He is a firm foundation. Without him, there is no solid foundation, but he's reliable, especially in God's plan of salvation. He is the measurement guide for all other believers. In action, in attitude, in affection, he's the reference point that God has set so that every other stone that's a part of his spiritual building would align themselves with that reference point. You know, Peter even carries on this metaphor and this imagery in his, in his book. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, it reads, You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So what is he saying here? He takes this step further and says that, says that you, you are a living stone, which is a piece of God's spiritual building, his spiritual house. And then he goes on to say in, his chap in this chapter, referring to Jesus as the chief and precious cornerstone. You see, for believers today, their reference point is Jesus Christ. Everything about their life should always seek to align itself and to conform with Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus Christ understands and knows that he is the standard of the church. And you could see it as he gives certain commands, especially as he gave certain commands to his disciples. Let's look at John chapter three. I'll show you what I mean. In verse 34 to 35, it says, a new command I give you, love one another and pay attention. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You see what he does? He doesn't just give the command to love one another. He sets the reference point, the standard. He says, as I have loved you, you should love one another. In other words, think about how I have loved you throughout this time together. Think about how I endured with you. Think about how I cared for you. Okay, that is the reference point. Align yourself with that example when you go after loving one another. It's important to see Jesus calls himself, he refers to himself as the measurement of our love for each other. You see, without that measurement guide, without Jesus as the cornerstone, the focal point, what we tend to do is create our own standards of love. You see, we can might go as far as to say, all right, I'm imitating Jesus. He loved people. I'm going to love people. But because we don't use him as a reference point, we don't strive to love people to the degree that Jesus loved people. You see, that's the meaning of the word as in Greek, kathos, to the degree of, in proportion of. He's saying, don't just do what I did, do it to the degree that I have done it and how I loved you, love one another. You know, just to even paint a clearer picture of Jesus's love, how he set the standard for his disciples, it's important for us to know how he loved because that is the same standard for us today as believers. How he has loved us, how he has loved his disciples, that should be our measurement in how we love one another today. So let's look at a couple of examples. The first example comes in John chapter 13. 
Jesus is preparing himself to wash his disciples' feet. Let's jump in at verse four to five. It says, so he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. What we see is just this great sense of humility in Jesus' love for his disciples. You see, at that time, in them journeying through the Judean hill country, sandals, dirt roads, you can imagine their feet are pretty dirty. And at that time, again, during the context of when they lived, you know, washing the feet of another person was usually an activity reserved for a slave or a servant. Jesus, knowing that he is their teacher, their rabbi, that's a term of respect. He is their Lord. He humbles himself to the position of a servant, of a slave, and he takes care of their practical needs of their feet being washed. You see, an aspect of Jesus's love was that it was serving. It was humble. It was, it took care of the needs of others. Let's look at another example. It's in Mark chapter eight. At this point, he's having a conversation with his disciples and he says, uh, be aware of the yeast of the Pharisees. So what he's trying to do is, is bring in this imagery of yeast and, um, you know, bread and, and basically stay away from the yeast of the Pharisees because Basically, he's describing their, 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 their hypocrisy as yeast because it, it just spreads and just uh, expands throughout the whole dough. And the, the disciples looking and hearing him talking about yeast, they get confused and they think he's actually talking about bread when he's really talking about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. But let's look at this conversation he has. You can just sense, you know, a, a, a spirit of maybe a little bit of frustration, like you're not getting this. But you also see a spirit of patience and him really drawing them out. Let's look at Mark chapter 8, verse 16 to 21. It says, they discussed this with one another and said, is it because we have no bread? Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do Do your eyes fail to see and your ears and ears, but failed to hear. And don't you remember when I broke five loaves for the 5,000? How many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? 12, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? You see, Jesus, he's like, "What? why are we talking about having no bread? Do you really think I'm concerned with having no bread? Do you not remember when I took just a few pieces of bread and multiplied it miraculously to feed 5,000? And then I did the same thing later to feed 4,000. And and there was extra. I started with little. I expanded it to thousands. And there was even more than what we started with, than what we started with. Do you really think I'm concerned about having no bread? Do you still not understand? You see, Jesus had times where he did get frustrated with the the hardened hearts of his disciples and their lack of understanding. But nevertheless, he persevered in loving them. He was patient with their shortcomings. That's another aspect of his love. Let's look at another aspect in Mark chapter 8, same chapter, verse 33. It says, but when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. He, he said, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but, me, but merely human concerns. So the context of this verse is that Jesus is describing his death to his uh, disciples. Peter, not fully understanding Jesus' role as the Messiah, says, no, we're not going to let you die. You can't die. And he rebukes Jesus. And then Jesus, instead of allowing him to continue in his faulty thinking. He challenges him. He speaks honestly. He says, no, your mind is in the wrong place, Peter. Your mind isn't on the things of God. It's on merely human concerns. And this is another aspect about Jesus's love. His, uh, this aspect about Jesus's love is that he was concerned of the growth, the maturity of his disciples. He didn't just let things go. No, he took opportunities to teach them, to call them higher, to correct them, to even speak the truth in love and rebuke them. Jesus loved 
in the sense of always being concerned with the maturing of his disciples. This is another aspect of his love. So far, Jesus' love is humble. Uh, it is patient, but it is constantly striving to mature his disciples as well. Let's look at another example of Jesus' love. This example is in John 17, verse 12. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus is praying to his father and he's essentially saying, I protected my disciples. I kept them safe. You know, another one was lost except the one that was doomed to destruction. He was referring to Judas, his betrayer. But I love this aspect of Jesus' love as well because we see the protective side of his love. Not only did he protect them physically, however, he also protected them spiritually. He protected their minds. He protected their, their hearts. He was always striving to protect them physically and spiritually, even Judas. And this is a very important point to make. Judas is not like Jesus was caught off guard that Judas betrayed him. He knew from the very beginning that Judas was going to be the one to betray him, to turn him in for 30 pieces of silver. But yet that did not stop him from loving Judas. You see, Jesus' love for Judas was not dependent on whether or not it was, it was reciprocated. And you see this beautifully illustrated uh, in this in this uh, in chapter 14 in the book of Mark. Let me show you what I mean by this. They're having this dinner, okay? So it's the, the Passover meal. And just look at these two verses. In verse chapter 17 and 18, it says, When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me one who is eating with me. You see, we might not catch what's going on, but to the first century hearer, they would cringe after hearing this in scripture. Jesus is having this meal with his disciples and one of them is his betrayer. Now, what's so significant about this? At that time, table fellowship, what they called, having a meal was usually spent with the ones most closest to you your family, your, your close friends. They called it table fellowship, a very intimate bond, a connection with another person. And we see Jesus participating in this intimate environment with one who is going to betray him. Jesus was so relentless for intimacy. Nothing was going to stop him from pursuing an intimate love with his disciples. Table fellowship, he still participated it, participated in it with the one who essentially did not reciprocate the love and the desire for intimacy. You know, Jesus was so relentless in loving with passion, pursuing intimacy. Let's look at one last example of Jesus' love for his disciples. This is in John chapter 19, verse 26. It says, When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved, standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. And what Jesus is essentially doing here, and this is this is crucial to, to understand. He, he is He's looking at his mom and he's saying, Hey, th this is your son. Pointing to his disciple whom he loved. I believe that's John. Mother, John is now your son. Treat him like your son. Take care of him. Then he looks at John and says, this is your mother. Take care of, of, of my mom as your mom. And then from that time on, he took her, uh, John took her into his household. And you just see Jesus being outward centered, thinking about those around him. He's thinking about his mom, thinking about his disciple. But what's so convicting is the context. What is going on? as he's thinking about the needs of other people, as, he think, as he's thinking about the needs of his disciple, about his, uh, the needs of his mom. Well, let's look a couple of verses earlier to see what's the context. In verse 17 to 18, it says, carrying his cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him. 
and with him to others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. What is going on? Jesus is being crucified. He's actually hanging on the cross in pain, pierced hands and pierced feet, grasping for breath. You know, because how the crucifixion was set up, it was very difficult, especially after they bruised the body and flogged the body. It was very challenging to breathe while hanging on the cross. So you had to push against pierced feet to breathe. And then after breathing and getting tired, you, you dropped and you start to hang on pierced hands. This is the setting as he's thinking about the needs of his disciples. Do you see how deep, how selfless the love of Jesus was for his disciples? It was amazing. So after this, this quick survey, just a few passages. We didn't even do a deep study in his life. Just after a few passages, we see the love of Jesus being humble, serving, persevering, patient, passionate, seeking intimacy, selfless. This was the reference point to the command, love one another as I have loved you. Question, who is your reference point when it comes to your love? for other believers, or even your love for other people? What is your standard? To what are you striving to align yourself with or to conform to? Is it Jesus Christ? God intends for him to be the reference point, the cornerstone, the the the, the, the stone that sets the standard, the measurement guide. He intends for Jesus Christ to be the measurement guide in our life and everything, especially in our love for others. Think about your love for other believers. Think about your love for those even outside the church, co-workers. Uh, then you might have friends that don't attend a church or aren't religious. You might have friends in your community, in your neighbors. You might even have, you know, children, you know, kids that don't necessarily believe in God. What is your standard for loving them? You see, whether it's Jesus' love for his disciples or Jesus' love for people, they both serve as a measurement guide for how we ought to love others. We have to pursue this, not only in the church, but outside the church, in our families. Are we pursuing the reference point for all of our behavior, affections, and attitudes? Now, after saying that, if you're like me, you must be feeling a bit overwhelmed. Because we are imperfect people serving an imper- uh, serving a perfect God. Excuse me. That is our, our theme here at Valley Christian. We, we are imperfect people serving a perfect God. Jesus' love was perfect. And we, we're just going to continually strive and strive, but we're going to fall short at times. We're, we're going to fail at times. And it can feel overwhelming pursuing his standard of love. I want to direct you to pray, to pray. Because if there's anyone that can transform your love, that can overflow your love, it is God. So we must bring this to the feet of God and pray, just like we see Paul praying in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. You see, this church was known for loving each other. But look at this prayer in 1 Thessalonians, actually chapter, yeah, chapter 3, verse 12. It says, may the Lord, may the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other. And for everyone else, just as ours does for you. Paul is praying, may the Lord, may God cause your love to overflow. May God transform your heart and to help you and enable you to love even more and more and more and more. You see, we should feel inspired to pray because if God is engaged in transforming us, If he is engaged in causing love to overflow, we have such a potential to have such an impact with the love we give to others, to one another. And just think about just Paul, for example. Paul, the one saying, hey, pray that the Lord may increase your love. Paul was someone who once persecuted the church. Like he once was against Christians and the Christian faith. He had no love for Christians. Like in Acts chapter 8, verse 3. 
It says, but Saul, which was his name before, began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he d- he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. This was Paul before being changed by God. He was against Christianity. He persecuted believers. He threw them in prison. He approved the death of even some disciples like Stephen. And then you fast forward, him having an encounter with Jesus, God transforming his heart. And then look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and him describing his relationship with the, with the church in Thessalonica. Verses 7 to 8. Instead, we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Do you see the transformation? He's now describing his love for other Christians as that of a mother who cares for her children. And then later he describes his love as a father who cares for his children. How in the world did Paul get there? Do we think he just threw personal striving, he transformed himself and that he just grew out of just, you know, this good discipline? Do we think he just read a lot of self-help books? No, it was God who changed him. God who caused his heart to be full of love. That is the same thing that can happen with you and I if we devote ourselves to prayer, praying that God may cause our love to overflow with one another. Are we praying this? Do we want to pray this? We must bring this call to love one another another before the feet of God, asking him to change us, to cause our love to overflow. Amen? Amen. So that's one response to knowing that Jesus is the reference point. He is the standard in all that we do, in all that we believe. He is the alignment that which we should conform with. In love especially, we should first respond with prayer, a devotion to prayer. Secondly, we actually do need to respond with effort and strive to imitate him. And what do I mean by that? Let's look at First Thessalonians chapter 4. This is the same book that uh, Paul was writing his prayer in chapter 3. And in chapter 4, he says in verse 9, Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. So what is Paul saying? He's saying, we know that you're loving one another, but do this. I'm urging you to do it. Like you do it. Prioritize it. Put forth effort. Be intentional. Do it more and more. You see, the other side to really pursuing Jesus as a reference point, one is prayer, but the other is intense effort. We have to try. We have to strive. And we must urge one another to do so, to love one another, just as Jesus have loved us. You know, Paul in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 to 2, he says, follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the, in the way of love, just as Christ Jesus loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. You know, Paul is saying, follow God's example. Walk, walk in love. Some of us just need to just stop making excuses. Get up and walk in love. Pursue it. Just as Jesus has loved has loved us. Are we walking in love. And as we're walking in love, it's important that we're growing in our sensitivity, especially when it comes to being sensitive to the needs of other people. Because a part of loving others, especially loving others in the church, is being aware of needs and meeting those needs. Let me show you what I mean. In 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 to 18, it says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother in need, but has no pity on him, on them, how can the love of God be in that person? 
Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with action and in truth. You see, as we strive to love one another, let it be more than just words. Let's love with action and truth. You know, if we have the means to help and we see someone in need, let's strive to have sympathy and compassion and pity and strive to have the heart of God as we strive to meet that need. You see, I don't think the problem is we don't have the means to help. I think the problem could be at times for us, we just fail to see those needs. For whatever reason, either we're just not going deep enough in our relationships, or, or, or maybe we're just not engaged enough. Like if, if, if you're unaware of the needs within the church, it's probably because you're not engaged enough to, to even see those needs. Because trust me, there are needs. We just got to go deep enough to find them. There's times where I struggle with just being shallow in relationship, just keeping it superficial when it comes to, how are you doing? Oh, doing good. Oh, okay, cool. How was your week? Oh, good. Okay, cool. You've been reading the Bible? Yeah, yeah. How's that been going? All right, good. And it's just shallow. Instead of really getting in there, how's things going with the family? You know, I, I remember you mentioned something about your extended family not too long ago. How are things going with that? How have you been feeling? We need to go deeper with one another so that we can identify needs, whether emotional needs, uh, materialistic needs, physical needs, spiritual needs. We just got to be around each other enough, deep, deepening our friendships so we could see and identify those needs. And hopefully through the grace of God, our hearts are moved and are sensitive to those needs. And we're able to move towards compassion and sympathy and strive to love them by meeting those needs. Are you guys with me? We must grow in our love as we talk about pursuing Jesus as our cornerstone. Let me give another example of how we could grow in our love. Let's look at Titus chapter 3, verse 14. Uh, It says, Our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. You see, Paul is writing Timothy or Titus, and at the end of the his book, he's saying, or at the end of his letter, he's saying, our people must learn. We must learn to devote themselves. They must learn to devote themselves to meeting, to doing what is good, to meet urgent needs. Now, that's pretty interesting. Although they are saved Christians, although they have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, although they have the word of God, they still need to learn how to devote themselves to doing what is good. You see, sometimes we could be very passive about loving one another, even about doing good to others. We just, oh, we're just kind of on autopilot and like, oh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Christian. So, you know, naturally I'm going to do good, but we don't see it as an opportunity. How can we learn to devote ourselves to doing it more and more? And not just love and learn in general, but some of us need to learn how to be devoted to doing good and meeting needs within our own stage in life. You know, we're all come from different stages of life. You know, for example, with me, how I'm devoted to people and meeting needs is different today than when it was when I was a college student. (laughs) When I was a college student living on my own, you know, a part time job just in school, no responsibility, hardly outside of school. Like it just looked different. I just had more time. I had I had the ability to focus on multiple things outside of myself. But now today, fast forward to today, I got a family of my own. You know, I'm married. I got, I got a wife. I'm a grown man. <laughs> I got three kids. One of them is a baby. She's one years old. They need my attention. I need to play with my kids. I need to teach my kids. I need to be around enough so they can learn my faith, so I could transfer my faith to them, teaching them about their father in heaven. And they need to see me around my wife. They need to see how I love her so they can see an illustration of the God. That is time and energy. So loving others, loving other believers, loving other people outside of my family, it's just going to look different because I have those other responsibilities. And I need to learn still. It's not an excuse for me not to love other people, love other Christians. But it is a a call to, to think differently about what is going to look like in my stage in life. I need to learn in this stage of life how to devote myself to doing what is good. Are you learning? in your stage in life, how to devote yourself to doing good and to meet urgent needs. You know, as we close out this morning, I do want to remind us on a passage in Hebrews chapter six, 
verse 10, it says, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. And I want to end off with this passage because as we think about striving to, to align ourselves with the cornerstone of God's spiritual building of the church, that cornerstone being Jesus, and we ought to conform to his example and in every aspect of life and actions and attitudes and affections. And as we're striving, we're praying. And as we're praying, we're striving. We're, but we're asking God, cause our love to overflow and help us to align ourselves with Christ. But on top of that, we're actually putting forth effort. We're prioritizing it. We're learning. We're growing. And we're putting forth a lot of work to love, to love, to love. I want to remind you, God is not unjust. He will never forget the love you have shown him as you strove to love others. Have you strove to love other believers? The work you have done and the work that you continue to do, God will not forget. Let this be your motivation. It is not insignificant for you to strive to learn how to grow in your love. Even if it's not reciprocated, even if it's not recognized, God recognizes, God will reciprocate. God will never forget the love you have shown him as you loved his people. As we close out our time this morning, really think about your life. What is the reference point? Is it Jesus Christ? Because that is God's will for you, that Jesus Christ will be the cornerstone that will set the standard and the direction for your life in your actions, in your affections, in your attitudes. Let's close out our time with a word of prayer. Dear Father God, thank you so much for this time just to connect with you. I pray that you really are with us when it comes to us growing in our faith and just aligning ourselves more and more with the cornerstone of your church, Jesus Christ. Help us to constantly keep one eye, on, one eye on him, one eye on our life. One eye on him, one eye on our life. And we're constantly looking at him as our reference point. Please help us pray and just plead with you that you will cause our love to overflow for one another. I pray that you transform us every day, more and more inwardly and outwardly. Thank you so much for this time to connect to scripture this morning. In your son's name we pray, amen. When Jesus gathered the twelve disciples to share the Passover meal once more, remember breaking the bread, remember wine flowing red. This is a sign of a brand new promise. I will be poured out to set you free. Remember, do this for me. died and took my place. Remember the sin that no longer haunts you. Remember the hope that has set you free. Until we're standing face to face. Remember, remember me. When Peter said he would not deny him, you know I'm ready to die with you. Remember three times tonight. Remember you will deny. Then after Jesus had been arrested, Peter denied him for the third time. Remember the Lord looked at him. Jesus died and took my place. 
Remember the sin that no longer haunts you. Remember the hope that has set you free. Until we're standing face to face. Remember, remember me. When Jesus saw the adulterous woman, and he was asked if she should be stoned, remember, he made not a sound. Remember, he rode on the ground. He said, the one without sin among you shall be the one to throw the first stone. Remember, all walked away. Sin no more. Remember, remember the bread that is for my body. Remember the cup that is for my blood. Oh, help me not forget the grace when Jesus died and took my place. Remember the sin that no longer haunts you. Remember the hope that has set you free. Until we're standing face to face, remember, remember me. You know, there are a few people in sports history, and I'm a sports fan, who have literally changed the game. And usually these people are considered the greatest of all time. And we think of them as game changers. If you were in a basketball game and Michael Jordan showed up, game changer. When he, even as a, as someone with the flu, he changed the game. He won championship after championship. And I believe to his team, when he showed up and when he played, he made all the difference in the world. I think about the same boat when he showed up on the track in field scene. He was tall and lanky and they, many thought, how can someone so tall generate so much speed? And then they saw him run. Game changer. Messi shows up on the scene, not the biggest guy, maybe not even the fastest guy, but man, you get him on the pitch and he changes the game. And we know about Serena. When she started Venus was better than her, but eventually she literally changed the game of women's tennis. All four of these people are game changers. But I think about spiritually speaking, what is the game changer in your life? For many of us, before we encountered the cross, which is the ultimate game changer, we were lost. We were in darkness. We were confused. We were hopeless and helpless. And then we encountered the cross and our lives changed. Our destinies changed. Our understanding of our spirituality and spiritual things changed. Everything changed. At least it was supposed to change. You know, I I want you to think about your life today. Not 10 years ago, not 15 years ago, But today, how different is your life today than when you, than when you, before you met Christ, before you became a disciple of Jesus Christ? You know, one measure really is our relationships. How are our relationships in our lives with family, with strangers, with brothers and sisters in Christ? You know, one of the things that Jesus achieved through the cross in the resurrection was this ministry of reconciliation. And to reconcile is to bring back into right relationship. And in verse 11 through in in chapter five of second Corinthians, verse 11 and following, Paul talks about this ministry of reconciliation. And in verse 16, he says, so from now on, we regard no one from our worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. 
that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I have one simple question for this time of communion. How are your relationships? Has Jesus in the cross been a game changer in the, in the area of relationships in your life? You say, Delano, why is that so important? Because there's a scripture in 1 John, I believe it's in chapter 4, that says, if we claim to love God, how can we claim to love God who we do not see if we don't love our brother or sister whom we do see? You see, that cross needs to mean something. That cross needs to generate change in our lives. And so as we take communion this morning, if the cross is the ultimate game changer, it should also change our relationships. There should be reconciliation in our lives with family, with friends, with brothers, and with sisters. Even with our enemies, we are to be reconciled somehow to love them, as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. And I know this is challenging because I think we can go through our day, go through our life, go through decades of really not thinking about the depth of our relationships or the quality of our relationships. But you know where that ministry of reconciliation starts is at the foot of the cross. It's realizing that without Jesus, we are nothing. And we are only something because of what Christ has made us in our new creation, in our newness of life. And I pray that it's in this newness of life that we strive to be reconciled with God through Christ, but reconciled with others through that same cross. Remember, the cross is the ultimate game changer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your Holy Spirit, your grace, and your mercy. Thank you for the way that you have changed my life and the lives of billions around the world. The cross has been and is and always will be the ultimate game changer in our lives. The old has, come, the old has passed, the new has come only because of Christ's sacrifice and resurrection. We pray as we take communion today that we can look at our lives, look at our relationship with you and with others. And we pray, Father, that if there's needs to be changed, that we will hold on to the cross and exhibit that change and go after that change so we truly may be ambassadors of Christ and preach this ministry of reconciliation. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for the bread that represents the body broken and the juice that represents the blood spilled for the forgiveness of our sin. God, we're grateful. And we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you again for joining us online. We are so glad that you did. We'd like to invite you to continue your experience by joining a discussion and fellowship. All you have to do if you would like to join is click on the link in the description below the video. We hope that you really enjoy that. If you are not watching it live, we would like to invite you to get more information, to ask a question, or to maybe even join a Bible study by clicking on the link in the description below the video. Feel free to explore and get more information, but whatever you do, have a great week. God bless. Thank you for coming. Thank you.